All right. So I want to thank uh, Tom Miner for joining us for a discussion around leadership. And uh, we're going to cover a whole range of topics like we have been throughout all of the interviews that we've been doing. Tom, first of all, welcome. Thank you for thank taking, you. taking some time. And can you just tell us a little bit about who you are, what your background is, and, and then we'll go sure. from there. Uh, I live in Washington State, born and raised here, and uh, I worked for the Pierce County Sheriff's Department from 1977 to uh, 2003. Uh, I retired as a major. I was in charge of uh, all patrol activities in Pierce County uh, that were not part of an incorporated uh, uh, city, and that included uh, patrol uh, investigations, search and rescue, um, and special special operations. Um, in uh, 1992, I became involved through my search and rescue connection with the National Urban Search and Rescue System. And so from uh, 1992 until 2003, um, that was kind of a, uh, it was a federally assisted program, but after 9-11, it became a fully federally funded program. So I left the Sheriff's Department in 2003 to become the full-time program manager for the Washington Urban Search and Rescue Task Force. And so from uh, 2003 till 2015, I was uh, full-time employed uh, responding to disasters. And from 2010 till 2015, I was one of three federal incident uh, management team leaders uh, responding to multiple disasters throughout the United States. Probably have 30 to 35 different disasters that I've responded to and been a part of the uh, management team trying to coordinate uh, assistance to local authorities. But who's counting, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I and, lost and it's that exact experience or experiences that um, I think we can draw upon because, correct me if I'm wrong, but there are common themes throughout whether, you know, over those 30 plus kind of incidents. And so that's exactly what we're going to be drawing upon and helping corporate America, corporate Canada kind of, you know, we can unpack that and, and maybe help them out, particularly during this, this period of time. So Tom, yeah, really didn't. particular... Event it really or... didn't matter what uh, what the disaster was. The the problems and the issues were always pretty much the same. And different people uh, were were forced to make tough decisions with limited information. So those those were always the environments that I went into, regardless of the nature of the event. Yeah, and and we just talked a little bit off camera about that need to control the inside and and your own emotions and your own thoughts and securities and all of those other things. So is there a particular incident or event that you could talk about where I guess any one of them would have the same common themes, but is there anything that would come to mind with regard to uh, that could help people that are watching this now to really uh, crystallize kind of the experiences that you've had? Yeah, most, most of the time I was responding to strangers. I was going to another community and uh, an environment that had been impacted and it, it wasn't it wasn't my community. It wasn't uh, the people that I knew. And so it was easier to be somewhat detached from those events and just focus on the issues at hand and try to help the community get, get uh, organized and, and refocused to what needed to be done. But uh, I was the uh, inc federal incident commander for the Oso landslide, landslide that occurred here in Washington State, uh, I think in 2014. And in that particular case, it became very personal because uh, the people, I did, though I didn't know any of the victims, I knew all of the responders. I had worked with the, the county responders and the state responders uh, here in Washington State most of my career, and they knew me. And uh, so it became very different in that sense um, and uh, was much more emotional than many of the other disasters that I'd been to, which again, I could detach myself from because I didn't know the people. Uh, so this current situation is you're dealing with your own, your own communities. You're dealing with uh, your own workers and trying to <clears throat> solve their immediate problems. And so it's very similar to that, I would think. So let's take the young Tom. I get it. You're still very young, but younger. <laughs> how about the younger Tom? Okay. What, so you're just stepping into, you know, whether it be into the HUSAR program or whatever, you know, kind of time frame you want to go into. What was the, the younger Tom thinking as a leader? You know, what were kind of the emotions or feelings and what were you trying to do when you were a young leader 
And then we'll contrast that with the Tom of today and, and let's see if there's a, a difference. So what, walk us through the younger a, Tom back in the day. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, I think the Tom was uh, more uh, focused at, at uh, doing uh, type A personality, getting the job done. And it was very hard back then to not be hands-on, not, not be the doer. Um, so a lot of my early activities were uh, the actual physical rescue uh, in, at the local level and, and being out in the front line um, leading a team but, uh, or, t- or teaching the skills so that others, others could do it as effectively. Uh, and over time, I realized that uh, I was more effective at organizing and managing other people and letting other people do the work uh, with direction. And it was much more effective um, and much more satisfying uh, as I got older to watch the results of other, other people uh, become successful uh, with good direction because they were floundering without direction. And I, I felt, I found my, my best role was, was, was getting people uh, going in the same direction and uh, uh, reaching the same goals uh, through good coordination and direction. So when you're, because uh, you talked about that type A personality and wanting to do that. So what would you tell people that are new leaders, whether it be in emergency services, but more specifically in this context, you know, corporate America, corporate Canada, because I think that's a pretty normal reaction, right? To want to do, 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 do. But so what would you tell them when they're in that same situation? Because you're also leading people typically with more experience than you, older than you. Um, you don't have a lot of street cred typically. So you know, can you walk us through what that might look like as a, as a young leader? If you were looking back and you had younger Tom, hey man, let's have a seat. Let's go for coffee. This is what I, this is the kind of guidance I'd give you. What would you tell um, them? Surround yourself with good people. Surround yourself with, uh, and, and educate yourself is by listening to the older, more senior people. Uh, get their, take their advice, but recognize that you're the one that ultimately has to Uh, take the lead and give direction, but uh, don't do it in a vacuum and then delegate tasks to people that you trust, uh, people that are most capable, uh, give them the the tasking to do the work and get out of their way and just from the background, support their efforts, make sure they have the tools, the resources, the authority to get things done that you've directed. and don't yeah. try to micromanage what they're doing. Um, yes, you might do it differently. Yes, you m- might think you can do it better, but you can't. Once you start doing something as a leader, your focus becomes that thing. And then you lose the big picture. As a leader, you have to focus on the big picture. What's working? What's not working? Uh, pay attention to the things that aren't working and encourage the things that are working. And the reason I asked that is because I remember when I was a young leader, I was always trying to prove myself, you know, and, and I always thought of it and I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on this. I always thought of it as good. I'm in charge now. Thank goodness. And I get to tell people what to do. And it was always about me, 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 which was a very looking back selfish and very immature way of looking at it. But did you, did you also feel that when you were, when you were just starting? Um, to some degree, but I think I've always had the attitude that uh, I can get more accomplished through the work of others uh, with, with good direction. And that I've always uh, empowered uh, my subordinates to make decisions and to to lean forward and people would come to me as when I was a sergeant and say, Hey, Sarge, I've got this problem. What should I do? I says, well, what, what do you want to do? What's your, what's your plan? Okay. sounds like a good plan. Go forth and do it. So I would tell people, don't, don't come to me for solutions. Uh, come to me with a plan. And if it's a good plan, we'll carry it out. And if it's not, we'll work on it, but make a decision. Don't wait for me to make the decision for you. So I've always empowered people to do that. And I've always encouraged people to uh, not be afraid of making a mistake. I'm not going to, I'm not going to crucify somebody for making a mistake if they made a decision because that's an opportunity to learn. What did we learn from, from that action that didn't work out? How can we do better 
the next time. Yeah, I often see that as a big obstacle when people talk about delegating and, and you know, uh, empowering others. It's this control issue that, well, I'm going to lose control and who knows, it's going to be chaos and all of those other things. And now as we, we see maybe a, a pretty seismic shift in how potentially we're doing business now with remote workplaces and things like that. With all of your experience, you know, going from, we would call it a centralized decision-making model to a decentralized, what kind of guidance would you give to those kind of managers that are typically used to calling a team meeting, going into the boardroom and saying, all right, this is what we need to do. How do you, what advice or guidance would you give to them? Cause now they're working over zoom or whatever. And there's probably a lot of fear about, man, how am I going to still lead and manage people remotely? So what kind of, what kind of guidance could you give to them? Um, you, you're going to have to look at your normal day-to-day uh, business model and scrap it because in it, it, and that's what happens in disasters. That's what's happening uh, in our current situation is we're seeing systems, regulations, rules at all levels of business and government hindering response and people seeking approval for things that need to happen now. And they can't wait days, weeks, or hours for those decisions to be made. Um, so you really have to look at your, your organization and go, what's, what's preventing us from being successful today? And let people know that they have the authority to override existing policy and procedures, have those discussions with folks and do what you need to do to take care of employees, people, stakeholders within whatever the organization is. Now we will, you know, and stay in communication, but when you can't reach out because of uh, technology limitations or the inability to get all the decision makers together, empower people to make a decision that's in the best interest of the organization and the people that, that work for you or that you're working for. And I think that's one of the greatest contrasts between, say, emergency services and corporate in that emergency services, we're used to, we're comfortable making decisions without all of the information. Like that's just part of the gig, right? And in you fact- will, You will I've never often, have all the information. No, and, that, and that's just it. And, and in fact, I often think, if I do think I know everything, I'm wrong. You know what I mean? And, and so what, like, how do you get comfortable making decisions without all the information? Cause that's just inherently like that. That's fearful for people that aren't used to, you know, having consensus and meetings and all those other things. Like how do you, how did you get comfortable making those decisions? I, I'm not sure you ever get totally comfortable. Uh, you just have to recognize that um, you, you gather as much information as you can that's available. You can only be held, it's kind of a legal standard, but you can only be held legally responsible for your decisions based on what you knew at the time. And so, you know, what I know tomorrow might change my decision and be willing to change your course of action when you get more information. But based on what you know right now, make a decision. And, and, and be comfortable with the fact that, that it may change tomorrow based on, on new additional information and learn from you know, the actions that you take. What I also tell people is no decision that you are going to make, no matter how much information you have, will not have an adverse effect on somebody. Every decision made, no matter how in-depth, no matter how educated, is going to affect somebody adversely. And you're seeing many, many, many decisions being made across this country, which no matter what the intention is, no matter how much information they have, adversely affects many of us. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just what it is. Understand that that's going to happen. And then you start putting plans in place to help those people that it's adversely affecting. And so I guess that's part of the quote unquote, bigger paycheck, right? The, the responsibility or burden of leadership. And with that in mind, what, what do you think people are looking for in their leader, not only during crisis, but what about just in general? So if you were to say, what is that archetypal you know, leader? What, what are they looking for in your own experience? So when you go to an event, how are you trying to be as a leader? First, first off, I try to give people this, you know, I've got a, a leadership, I've got a team that comes with me. So I'm not, I'm not going to these things by myself. I have a team. And the first thing we do is we, we sit down as a team and we lay out, why are we here? 
What's, what are we trying to accomplish? What are our goals and objectives for the next operational period, whether that's today, uh, the next hour, the next day, or the next week? What are we trying to accomplish? And take it a, a, a bite at a time, usually, usually at a day at a time. And so that everybody on that team knows what we're trying, what, here's our goals, here's what we're trying to accomplish. And everybody should be marching, doing something towards achieving those goals. Uh, and then a, a, a clear understanding of who's responsible for what, uh, what the reporting chain is or isn't, uh, and what their authorities are. So a, a clear understanding up front. And then I stand back and watch and listen. And what I tell people, uh, my, my position in an organization is stand around with my one hand in my pocket and one hand with a cup of coffee. It may not have anything in it, but it's gonna be a cup in the other hand. Because I should never as a leader be doing because what happens when you start doing something, you lose focus. So I'm listening to conversations, I'm watching people work, and I'm watching for them to get frustrated, and I'm watching for their voices to change. And that's when I walk over and say, what's up? How can I help? What's, what's frustrating you at this moment in time? Why can't you get your part of the task accomplished? And then my job is to solve whatever is causing that frustration and to resolve whatever conflict is going on and then step away and let them continue to do their job. And so that's, you know, that's how I manage people. You, you nailed it because I think as leaders, there's this badge of honor that if I'm not running around like a chicken with my head cut off, I'm not being valuable. I'm not doing my job, but I agree with you. Like I would rather walk into a situation. And in fact, the, the leader, the manager, whoever, they're a very good litmus test for how this thing is going because if a leader is walking around and coffee in hand and hand in the pocket, well, one of two things, they're either blissfully detached from what's going on, <laughs> which I've also come across, but the other yes. side is, you know, uh, leadership presence, you know, and I think that's a big thing. And, and I've spoken a lot about the emotions of leadership. And so speak about that in terms of the leader's role in establishing what is that culture emotionally or energetically of a team? Cause it, you know, the contrast is nice and calm, cool and collected, but then the other one is absolutely frenetic. So it sounds like you're choosing the calm, cool and collected. So why is that? And, and what's the benefit of having a leader that's that way versus say the one that's running around like crazy? I, I think it just, uh, it evokes a, a air of professionalism, confidence and competence to the people you're there to try to help. Um, you know, when I walk into, uh, a community that's that's uh, been devastated um, by a by an event, you know, whether it's a hurricane or tornado uh, uh, or a terrorist event, they're they're victims. That they, you know, just like we all are right now, they're victims, and they're 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 emotionally uh, uh, impacted by what's going on around them. Uh, I'm coming in as an outsider, and first of all, I have to ingratiate myself with the people that I'm there to assist with. And the only way I can do that is to, you know, be somewhat detached, uh, have an air of, of confidence uh, and sit back and say, how can we help? We're here to help you. What's your biggest issues? How can, how can I help you right now? Here's what I can do for you. Here are the things that, that, that I bring with me. This is why I'm here, you know, and when you've got a minute, you know, um, I'll be over there when you have a minute, let's talk and talk about how we can take some of this pressure off of you. So it's, it's, if I came in with my hair on fire, they're, they're already dealing with people left and right with that very, very uh, uh, issue for, for good reasons. I, I don't, when I come in to assist somebody, I need to come in calm, cool and collected and just let them know why I'm there, what I can do to assist. Um, so that over time, I just found that that's the, the most effective way of, of doing things And my staff or my, the people that work for me over the years, uh, seem to appreciate that, that approach, uh, knowing that I trusted them to do their job. Um, all I had to do is give them direction. And, and the, the best thing ever is I would, I would walk over to my, my uh, logistics chief, uh, on my team and say, Hey, are you aware of the problem out at such and such a look? Yep. Yep. We're on it, boss. We've got it. So even though I became aware of it, uh, what I always loved was my, my staff was one step ahead of me at almost every turn. They were almost always dealing with the issue already. They ha didn't have to come to me and say, Hey, we need help with this. If they did that, that you know, I would, 
it wasn't a surprise to me. I usually knew they were dealing with it. And if they couldn't solve it, they would come to me for help. Um, rarely, rarely, rarely was I ever surprised in, uh, or, or surprised one of my subordinates with something that they weren't already aware of and working on. And so that's and a sign so of a good team. How do you create that, Tom? You know, because I, I experienced that as well. High performing teams are, are teams that operate, they're self-correcting and they don't need a lot of guidance necessarily. But from your perspective, telling somebody in, you know, corporate America, corporate Canada, like how do you create a team that's, you know, proactive and, and not looking to you to be making directions all the time? Because we see that a lot where they just yeah. get paralyzed and then they're looking up at the, at the manager and the leader say, well, what would you like us to do? So how do you create a team like that? That is, that is a really, really tough question. I, I, I was blessed in that I had people on my team from all over the United States. In fact, as the, as the young Tom Miner, it used to be, what am I doing here? I am surrounded by experts at all levels. And, and am I really qualified to be here? But it, it became pretty obvious to me early on that my skills and my experience uh, held me in good stead with other people at all, all levels from New York City and LA and Florida and other, other big metropolitan areas. You know, I had as much experience as they did in, in a wide variety of, of things and uh, skills and knowledge, but it was, it was, it was leadership. It was, it was just trusting those people, getting them together, sitting down with them, talking about how we were going to operate. And I think that's what's important right now is, is CEOs and executives uh, <clears throat> need to sit down with their, their trusted team members, people that they obviously hired because they were, they had confidence in them. They moved them up in their hierarchy because they had confidence in them and setting down the new, the new uh, dynamics. This is, this is the world we're in today. This is how we're going to operate. These are, these are our current goals and objectives, uh, which is hopefully let's take care of our employees. Let's do the right things to keep them healthy and keep them solvent. And with the bottom line of making sure that our business or our organization can, can step, you know, step right back in when this is over and go back to work. Those would be the basic goals that I would try to set up right now, no matter what my business was, is take care of the people, take care of the business, make sure we're viable. Those are our goals. Those are objectives. How do we do it? And then it's trust so your team to do that. And so let's talk about trust because I think without trust, you don't have anything, you know, you nope. don't have a cohesive team. You don't have anything like that. So how do you, how do you build trust? Because I think that a lot of people just kind of assume that it will be in place because you're the leader and, and there's a subordinate, but in your experience, what are some ways that you built trust with your teams? Because I think, again, that's just such a fundamental component of leadership. So, you know, in your experience, what worked, what didn't, for example? I, I, again, I think it goes back to you don't you don't uh, punish somebody for making a, a a good faith decision that maybe wouldn't have been the decision that you make. Uh, you approach that as okay, we probably don't want to do that again, um, you know, and here's why. Um, but you don't fire them, you don't you don't crucify them, you don't you don't uh, embarrass them. Uh, that's a private one on one discussion. But uh, publicly, when somebody makes a good decision, make sure everybody's aware of who's responsible for that decision. Make sure that that, that person, th those individuals, get the credit for what they're doing, not you. It, it, it's not about you. It's about, about the people. And that's how you build trust, is that's how you make sure that people are going to do the right things by encouraging them to make decisions. Uh, don't be a worry, worried about stepping on, on toes or, or making a mistake, because we'll live through those. But let's learn from every one of the mistakes. Uh, you know, what I tell people is don't make the mistake twice. <laughs> you know, yeah. this was, this is your learning opportunity. You know, don't keep making that mistake, but uh, learn from it and let's move on. Well, and that's how I build that... trust with the people. They, they know they're free to make decisions and that they're not going to lose their job or be brutalized publicly if they make the wrong decision because people make, make mistakes. That's how you learn. So what do you tell the people that, well, if I empower them, like, man, man, like it's going to be chaos. It's, it's anarchy. We're going to have mavericks, you know, rogue well, within people. limitations, you, ha you have to set the goals and the objectives. This is what we're trying to accomplish. This is your uh, area of responsibility. You have the authority to make decisions within, within that lane. Um, and here's the limit of your authority, um, unless you can't get a hold of the next layer. 
then do what you think has to be done. And then let me know that you've done it so that you, we can we can adapt to whatever that decision may be. And, um, and I think there's just so much fear in general about stepping out of your lane and things like that. And, and so I, I really think what you're talking about are setting expectations as well. And so what role do expectations have and, and how did you set them back in, in your experience? Because in my experience, I can't hold somebody accountable for something if I didn't tell them what the expectation was and what the right and the left boundary were, because then it's exactly. ultimately, I, I set them up for failure. So how did you handle those types of things? You know, we, as you well know, we, we operate under the incident command system. And so roles and responsibilities are clearly identified in that, in that uh, uh, management system. Uh, uh, tasks and chains of command are, are clearly identified. Um, and training. There, there was copious amounts of training that went into every one of those positions. So people didn't just one day suddenly find themselves with the title of logistics section chief or operations section chief. They came with, with experience. And, and I would think that's the same in any large corporation is you don't just one day walk in out of college and get the, get the uh, uh, you know, director's job or a, a supervisor's job. You have to work your way up to it. So it, it's a matter of making sure you put the right people with the right level of experience. And you know what? It might not be your standard day-to-day uh, 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 supervisors today. It might be something where you do a, a, a field expedient uh, promotion to somebody who's got the skills and the knowledge and, and the expertise at this moment in time to solve whatever that unique problem is that you're facing. And it's probably different than your day-to-day normal uh, business decision uh, is, is how do I, instead of how do I uh, maintain my, my distribution system, how do I take care of people? Now that may be a different person in your organization than you would rely on for the other stuff. So yeah. it might be and, and I think picking often, the person who's most qualified at this time versus the person that's most senior. Again, ICS, just because you've got a chief's badge on doesn't mean you're qualified to, to be the particular person in the management team. Just because you're a, 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 a politician elected to the position doesn't mean you're qualified. You might have the authority and the responsibility, but you're a fool if you don't pick someone who's got the capability to do the task at hand. Don't tell them that, Tom. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> So well, good, good leaders surround themselves with experts and then delegate and get out of their way. And then they, they give the credit to those people for doing what they're doing. Um, and in return, that's recognized that that was good leadership. So that's exactly what we should be telling people is get out of their way, put the right people in the right positions, let them do their job with parameters. And, and why do you think in your experience, people are sometimes reluctant to surround themselves with, with, smarter, more capable people. Because I, I, like you, I think when I look around a room, if I think I'm the smartest guy in the room, then I'm in the wrong room. You know, in your experience, why is it sometimes hard for people to, to surround themselves? I don't really know why you wouldn't want to do that uh, other than ego and, and pride. Um, you know, that's, that ego's got to go out the door. Turf's got to go out the door. You, you have to start thinking about what, what am I trying to accomplish and how is the best way to get there? And if I don't know something, I need to find somebody that can teach me or tell me what the best way of accomplishing something is. And, and you dig deep to find those experts and, and you never stop digging. If you're the person responsible and the leader in charge, you never stop digging for information that helps you make better decisions. And when you identify somebody who is getting things done, uh, making good decisions, you grab them and you make them part of your team. Yeah, I, I would totally agree. And with that in mind too, I think it kind of goes back to your objectives and creating a mission-driven culture first so that you know what you're trying to achieve and then you work backwards. And then in my experience, and I'd like to hear your opinion, a lot of that ego just kind of dissolves if you're putting the mission first every time. Do you have any thoughts or comments on that? No, abs- absolutely. Uh, we, we manage by objective. You know, what can I, what can I accomplish uh, in this first operational period, this first 24 hours of this event, what can I accomplish with the resources that I have at hand? That's all I can focus on. That's, that's, that's doable. If I look so far forward, uh, trying to, trying to do something that's, that's, you know, light years in front of me because I don't have the resources or the money or the, uh, 
materials to do it, then I'm wasting my time. What can I do right now with what I have available to me? What do I need to continue this process tomorrow? Where am I going to get those resources, that funding, those, those, those people to do the job tomorrow? So it's, it's multiple phase. What can I do right now? That's operations. What can I do tomorrow? That's plans. Logistics gets me the stuff that I can continue my plan into the foreseeable future. Um, so break it down like that and, and think only about what am I trying to accomplish today? Uh, another one of my favorite sayings is, is today is better than yesterday. Tomorrow will be better than today because we're putting things in place to improve the situation tomorrow. I mean, when you walk into a, a, a the initial uh, disaster state, it is, it is truly amazing to see the chaos and the dysfunction. And your goal is to try to eliminate that dysfunction, is to get, start getting people something to make their life better tomorrow than it is today, whether it's better food, uh, a, a roof over their head, um, uh, you know, running water, lights, a generator, anything, communications, you're giving them something to improve their situation. And so that it's no different in this particular situation is, okay, things are pretty grim right now. Are they, and, and it doesn't mean that it's not going to expand and there aren't going to be more people getting sick and it's not going to start looking worse, but is my situation getting better? Is, is my ability to deal with the situation getting better? Am I, have I got the resources in place to deal with people when they do get sick? Do I have a plan in place for, for what to do uh, if this plan doesn't, doesn't work? So I can start thinking about the next steps down the road if I take it one day at a time and, pl- and start thinking about, well, what's going to come next? And do I have a plan for that? And what's my objective today? Uh, and then start thinking about, and then put somebody to work, work dealing with that plan for today. And then somebody else starts thinking about, okay, this is happening today. What are we going to do tomorrow? What am I going to need to keep going tomorrow? So that's incident command in a nutshell, as, as you're well aware, is you're always looking forward to the next operational period, whatever you decide that is. Uh, but you can only deal with the, the things today that you have the resources and, and people and tools to, to work on. And so don't try to get too much done.